Let's stand together. When the Sabbath was over, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices they had prepared and went to the tomb so they could anoint Jesus' body. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, Suddenly, two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where they laid him. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him.
Well, good morning and welcome to Grace Bible Church this Easter Sunday morning. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, He is risen, and then the neighbor responds with, He is risen indeed. <laughs> We're glad that you're here this morning. If it's your first time here at Grace Bible Church, we have a visitor's card and some information about the church, along with a souvenir church mug we'd like to give to you to keep. And so if it's your first time with us on a Sunday morning, would you raise your hand and hold it up to one of these guys, one of our ushers, seizure? Oh! Ah. Okay. <laughs> we don't give out plastic mugs around here, okay? <laughs> Just keep your hand up. If they don't see you, they'll get to you in a minute. We're glad that you're here. If you'd take a few moments to fill out that visitor card and drop it in the offering plate when it comes by later on, we would appreciate having a record of your attendance. Again, we welcome you, and if you don't have a good Bible-believing church that you're part of, we'd invite you to come and make Grace your home church. A couple of quick announcements. Don't forget that tonight there is no 6 p.m. service. We, uh, on uh, holiday weekends, we cancel the evening service because we know a lot of people have friends and relatives from out of town. I know we have relatives from New York, and other people have relatives from where they're from up north or from just other parts of Florida. And so we encourage you to have an enjoyable day with your family and friends uh, on this holiday weekend. Another announcement, many of you know Fran Bauer. Uh, her husband, Bud, was an elder here for a number of years, very active volunteer here at the church and of course Fran has been over the years as well and uh, but her uh, health has been declining she's been uh, in the hospital for a little while and now she's at a rehab center but she's going to be moving up to Georgia with her daughter which is a good thing her daughter will be able to help take care of her up there but uh, she's going to be leaving on the 9th and so the Liskies would like to have an open house for her so that you can go there she'll be there and you can say uh, your goodbyes to her there on Saturday, April 6th, from 11, no, no, I'm sorry, from 1 to 3 p.m., from 1 to 3 p.m., and everybody would be invited. If you know Fran Bauer and would like to attend that, you're more than welcome to go there and, and say your goodbyes to her. At this time, we're going to remember our missionary of the week. On the back of our bulletins every week, we print a missionary of the week. These are people that Grace Bible Church supports, actually that you support with your giving, um, we send $165 every month to Source of Light to help them with their literature uh, production. They produce discipleship literature that they send out all around the world in multiple languages. And so it helps people uh, maybe in Europe or Africa or wherever it's sent uh, to then go on and grow in Christ. And so we uh, want to pray at this time for them. We pray that the Lord would bless them, continue to uh, raise up the finances they need and use their ministry for people to come to know Jesus. So would you join me as we pray? Father in heaven, this Easter Sunday morning we are reminded of the salvation that has been purchased for us by the great cost of Jesus' own life. Your only Son, your one and only Son, the unique God-man, the second person of the triune God coming to earth, taking on flesh, all with the the predetermined purpose of going to the cross that he might be the lamb without spot and, spot and blemish, that Passover lamb that would die for our sins so that our wrath, your wrath would not be poured out on us but on him so that we might have eternal life. And so, Father, we thank you. We thank you so much as we think about what Christ has done for us. And we pray this morning for source of light and their desire to help people grow in Christ through their literature that they produce and send out free of charge. Father, we pray that you would continue to raise up the funds that they need. We thank you we have a small part in that. We pray that you would bless their ministry and that you would provide the volunteers that they need every year as well to help with all of the things that go on there around their facilities. Father, we just pray for your blessings on those who give this morning and on those who will be using your gifts for your purposes in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let no one caught in sin remain Inside the lie of inward shame But fix your eyes upon the cross And run to him who showed great love And bled for us Freely you've bled for us Christ is risen from the dead Trampling over death by death Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead We are one with him again Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave But beneath the weight of all our sin You bow to none but heaven's will No scheme of man, no scoffer's crown No burden great can hold you down In strength you let your church proclaim Christ is risen from the dead Trampling over death by death Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead We are one with him again Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave And oh, death where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? Oh, church, come stand in the light. The glory of God has defeated the night. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? Oh, church, Come stand in the light Our God is not dead He's alive He's alive Christ is risen from the dead Trampling over death by death Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead Trampling over death by death Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead We are one with Him again Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave Let no one caught in sin remain Inside the lie of inward shame But fix your eyes upon the cross and run to him who showed great love. Thank you, Michael. Christ is risen from the dead. Let's come awake. Let's stand up and sing more about his resurrection.
Getting warm in here? Yes. I'll turn the air. <laughs> Let's put it this way if it gets cold, snuggle up to that person next to you. Unless it's somebody else's wife, okay, then you'll get in trouble. Boys and girls, you're dismissed to Children's Church. If you'd like to make your way over to the side door, follow Karen. Karen, thank you for teaching Children's Church. Appreciate it. I hope you got to join us for the pancake breakfast this morning. It was delicious. Um, if you didn't know Michael, the young man that just sang, is my cousin's grandson. So <laughs> figure that one out. That's the third cousin removed, something like that. And uh, they brought me down. I hate to say this, not, but since it's over, it's safe. They brought me down some pure maple syrup to put on my pancakes this morning. I love that stuff. That's like I'd be a I'd be a maple syrup addict <laughs> if I had enough of it. Uh, well, today is Easter Sunday, and we want to welcome you and take a look this morning at some things concerning what this Sunday is all about: the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'd like to read to you again from the passage that Tom read earlier in Matthew chapter 28 verses 1 through 10. It says there, after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him, they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we talk about this most remarkable event, the greatest event ever in human history, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that event which proved that He was who He claimed to be, the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of mankind, very God of very God, God the Son in human flesh, able not only to control nature, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to do miracles beyond number and beyond belief, but also even having power over death itself. It should be no marvel to us since He, along with you, created all that exists. And so, Father, this morning we come in celebration of what has happened for us. Christ died for us. 
He who knew no sin for those who have sinned, that we might not experience the wrath of God, but have eternal life through faith in Him. Father, I pray that our hearts would be open to the things concerning Your Word that we talk about this morning, and that we would grow more in love because of the appreciation we have for what Jesus has done for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. To the unsaved secular mind, the resurrection story seems like a fairy tale. Somebody coming back from the dead? I mean, come on. Really? Why does it seem so? Well, I think there are two primary reasons, and it's not the evidence that convinces people otherwise. It's common sense that people apply to the resurrection. You say, common sense? It is, where's Pastor going here? I believe in the resurrection. But there are many who do not because they think of one of these two things. Number one, they think, well, we have never seen a person who was clearly dead, then buried for three days, come back from the dead. How many of you have seen someone who's been buried for three days, come back from the dead? Raise your hand, please. But I'd be wondering if somebody raised their hand. Now, we have probably all heard stories of people who have supposedly, and I say that word because I, I think that once you're dead, you're dead. That's it. There's no second chances. But we have heard stories of people who in operations or other conditions have uh, feel that they have expired and then they see themselves above their bodies or they have some sort of experience and they, and they come back a little while later, maybe it's 15 minutes or a half hour or so, and they, they, those, in, those experiences impact them so much that they believe that they have died and come back. And they talk about that. And, and you and I have probably heard those stories and, and maybe if you're like me, you view, view them with great skepticism even though I have some relatives and dear friends who claim to have had those experiences. And the reason for that is because they're experiences, they're personal experiences. And we all know that under conditions like one, one person, uh, carbon monoxide, suppose, you know, when you breathe in enough carbon monoxide or anything, you may start seeing things before you even supposedly expire. Or under surgery, the anesthesia may have its effects. I remember undergoing a couple of different operations, one of which when they put the little mask on me and told me to start counting backwards from 100, I think I made it to maybe, maybe 90. I'm, I'm not sure it was that far, but by about 95, I was on my back, spinning down this multicolored tube and I was going somewhere and I didn't like where I was going I was going the wrong direction you know like, hey can we push the up button please you know getting a little nervous here and, and and it seemed almost real at the time and and surely you've had dreams that seem real as well and you wake up I got I remember being eaten by a shark in the Gulf of Mexico one time it was a dream for those of you who are sleeping for the first part it was a dream and but I was eaten by the shark, and, I, and, I, in the, and in my dream I died, and again, I'm on my back. I don't know, always on my back, spiraling down, and, and I hear this deep, booming voice that says, you are now dead, and it, deeper than that, and, and just, it's, I mean, I sat up in bed, and my heart's going, Brrr. I'm sweating, and, I, and just, it seems so real. And so we tend to dismiss those things. As we, as we look at those things, we say, well, okay, it's that person's experience. But there's really no concrete proof that they're ever really dead. The people that I know that are really dead are still really dead. And they stay that way. They don't come back. And so by our observations, we consider things like the fairy tale. As, as an unsaved person, the secular mind looks at this and says, okay, okay, you know, the disciples wanted, you know, they loved this guy. They traveled with him. They invested their lives into his life. And, you know, they were just so moved with emotion and passion that, that when they got there to the tomb, who knows what happened, but they thought he had come back. And so that's the natural, you know, he had said something about that. And so they run away saying, oh, guess what? Jesus really did come back from the dead. But... It was all just a lot of emotion and hype. And so people dismiss it. Secondly, there are those who dismiss the resurrection because they say, well, you know what? I can't raise anybody from the dead. And I don't know anyone who can. And so if I can't do it, why should I think somebody else can do it? Again, we base oftentimes our beliefs upon our own subjective, and if we're honest with us, they're subjective experiences and opinions. Not always on concrete proof. 
You can, and the best way to f- find that out is start talking about cars with men. Well, Chevy, of course, is the best. And then you, Ford is the best. They're, you know, somebody, and before long, they're ready, they're ready to fight with each other, right? Or, or motorcycles, you know, which motorcycle is the best? Or, or coffee, even, you know, which coffee is the best? And, and so people base their opinions oftentimes not on objective evidence, but on subjective ex- beliefs and experiences. And the problem with that is, is that sometimes we may be completely in the wrong but believe we're right because we base what we believe to be true on our own opinions. I don't want to base what I believe about eternal life, about that which happens to us after we pass from this life, on my subjective experience. I want to base it on something a little more concrete than that. A lot more concrete than that. Something that I can say, I know this to be true. There are unique people in the world that can do unique things that our experiences can't necessarily explain, that can do things that we can't do. For example, in 2009, an astonishing 18-foot drawing of the world's most famous skyline, New York City, was accomplished by an autistic artist named Stephen Wiltshire. After just 20 minutes in a helicopter ride flying above New York, maybe some of you have seen it. You can actually, they, they did a whole special on, on uh, savants and people with special abilities, autistic people sometimes that have special abilities. And this guy seeing New York City for the first time, flying over New York City, I believe he's from London originally. After 20 minutes of it, he was able from memory to reproduce an 18-foot drawing, 18 feet, I don't know, that's from from the electronic gizmo there uh, to here. Those are pretty neat. I like the symbols and everything on a pad, you know. I mean, it's a, it, but I'm guessing that's about 18 feet. And he recreated the whole coastline with all of the buildings. And the amazing thing is uh, he had, you know, the Twin Towers at the time were still there and all of these other famous buildings and radio towers on top of buildings and all from memory. And he drew this out over a period of several days without ever seeing it again all from memory. He didn't have a picture up there. You know, I'm the type of artist that if I draw something, it doesn't look too good after I'm done anyways. Now, Tom's pretty good at it. I'm lousy. But I have to have something there. And, and then I do this. And you know, I look at the picture and I try to recreate it as I'm looking at it. This guy did it completely from memory. Not only the New York skyline, but also in 2005, he did Tokyo on a 52-foot canvas. 52 feet. This room is only 40 feet wide. From that wall to that wall. Outside dimension is 42, so maybe a little over 40 feet. 52 feet of drawing something, and it looked like Tokyo. Buildings could be identified and things of that nature. Just amazing. Amazing. He not only did New York and Tokyo, he's done Rome, Hong Kong, Frankfurt, Madrid, Dubai, Jerusalem, and London, all on giant canvases. All from simply seeing the, the city for one time, and it's some, for some reason, the way he was born, the way his brain is wired, it's there. And he, can, and he also has the ability to recreate it on paper. And so he is unique, and he can do things because he is unique. And what I would like to suggest to you this morning is that Jesus could rise from the dead because Jesus is unique. He is the most unique being that has ever entered into our world. John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his monogene, one and only. There's no more, nothing more unique than being a one and only, and especially a one and only son of the living God. And so Jesus could do that which we cannot do, which we as human beings cannot do or imagine to do because he's not simply like one of us. Even when he became like one of us, he still wasn't exactly like one of us. He was flesh, he was human, but he was also God. He did not give up all of his attributes to be human. We know that because of the miracles and the other things that he did. Now there are those people that when I talk to them about the resurrection or talk to them about Jesus, they say, well, come on now. We, I mean, how do we even know that Jesus is a real person? After all, the only place we read about Jesus is in the Bible, right? Wrong. It's not the only place you can read about Jesus. There are several other sources that talk about Jesus outside of the Bible. Bible. 
The Babylonian Talmud is one. The Babylonian Talmud was, uh, it's a collection of interpretations of the Old Testament that was written over a period of time while the Jews were in captivity for 70 years in the kingdom of Babylon. And it was kept all the way after they left Babylon all the way up until somewhere right around 500 A.D., somewhere in that period of time. It's used by Jewish rabbis to discover various interpretations or, or ideas that other rabbis had concerning the Old Testament. And it is littered with possible, and I say possible, and this is one of the weakest evidences for the historical Christ, but it is littered with possible references to Yeshua, to Jesus. In Hebrew, that's Yeshua. It means Joshua in English. And there are other Joshua's. Certainly there were other Joshua's in the time of Christ, and so sometimes it's difficult to tell. There's a little bit of debate within um, uh, Judaism as to whether some of the references are references to Jesus or not. And good scholars on both sides have debated over the issue. And I'm talking about Jewish scholars with Jewish scholars, not Jewish scholars with Christian scholars, although sometimes it's been that as well. But that's, the, that's only one source. Then there's a Syriac letter written around 80 AD written by Mara Bar Serpian in which he mentions Jesus as a wise king. There's the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus. I've mentioned him before, 37 AD to 100 AD. In the Antiquities, Antiquities of the Jews, he writes extensively about Jesus, even talking about the fact that he was condemned by Pilate to the cross and that those who loved him forsook him, and that he appeared alive to them again on the third day. Flavius Josephus, to our knowledge, was never a believer. He was a Jewish historian who became a traitor to the Jews. He was in the Jewish army, and during the revolt of 66 AD, after Titus sent his legions in to conquer Jerusalem and ransack the city and burn, destroy and burn the temple, Josephus, knowing the Romans were a much bigger and stronger power than the Jews, decided, you know what, I think it's time to trade sides. <laughs> And so he's seen as a traitor, but most scholars accept his history as being accurate and reliable. And he writes extensively about Jesus. There are other passages as well that I'm not going to read for time, but I can give you the references if you'd like after the service. There's Pliny the Younger, another Roman historian who writes about Jesus. There's Tacitus, another Roman historian who writes about Jesus. And on the list goes, on and on. So much so that the Encyclopedia Britannica the new Encyclopedia Britannica, published in 1991 by the University of Chicago states, here's what they say about the evidence for the historical Christ. Did Jesus really exist? Was there really a Jesus of Nazareth? Here's what they say. And this is, was published by the University of Chicago, hardly, hardly a theologically conservative institution. Okay? It says, These independent accounts prove that in ancient times, even the opponents of Christianity... Even the opponents of Christianity never doubted the historicity of Jesus, which was disputed for the first time and on inadequate grounds at the end of the 18th, during the 19th, and at the beginning of the 20th centuries. And I'd like to submit continuing to this day. That's the New Encyclopedia Britannica, volume 22, page 360. That even the opponents of Christianity never disputed or doubted the historicity of Jesus. Jesus was a real person in time, space, and history. What you have to figure out now is who was he then? He really existed. There's ample proof for that. To deny that is like to say, I don't believe George Washington ever li lived. Somebody made up that picture on the dollar bill. You know, I've never seen him. Have you ever seen him? Anybody in here ever meet George? Didn't think so doesn't exist. People do that with Jesus, but they don't do that with George for some reason. So there's plenty of evidence that Christ was a real person, but that doesn't make him unique, unique enough to come back from the dead. What makes Christ unique? Well, let's talk about that for a while. First of all, the virgin birth makes him unique. Nobody before him and nobody after him has ever had a virgin birth. You say, well, can you prove he had a virgin birth? Okay, no, I can't. <laughs> I have to go on the testimony of Scripture for that one. But I believe it to be reliable enough to trust in it. I believe there's ample evidence for the reliability of the Scriptures to believe what the Scriptures say. But again, I'm starting off with the weakest points and moving to that which is stronger. There's also the events that surround his birth. There are the angelic announcements. They weren't witnessed just by Mary. They weren't witnessed just by Joseph. They were also witnessed by shepherds who were out in a field who left their flocks at night, good way to lose your job, 
right? Leave your flocks out in the field where the wolves can get them and go, go visit some baby born for who knows what reason. But when you have angels telling you something, it's a, you know, a little different than normal. It's not the stork dropping off the kid, you know? It's, okay. <laughs> then they, they, this, was a, this was real to them. They knew that this was real. And so they leave their flocks at night and they go and visit the Christ child. There's also the star which directed wise men, magi from the east, to come and visit the baby Jesus. Why would these wealthy, stargazing uh, astronomers slash astrologers travel from a distant land bringing expensive gifts to this Jewish baby boy? And this is rooted in time, space, and history because you remember as they came, they first, Herod calls them in and questions them and pretends to be uh, an interested worshiper and well, as well and says, hey, when you find this Jesus kid, you know, this future king, uh, let me know about it. I want to come and worship him as well. Yeah, right, you want to kill him. And so the wise men, not knowing that, they would have went back. But they were warned by an angel, don't go back and don't tell him. And so then we have Jesus and his family fleeing down into Egypt, where there they live until Herod finally dies so that they can come safely back to the promised land. And on and on it goes, all rooted in history and time and space. Unique, 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 unique. Things that never happened to any other human being in the world and never will. Then we have the claims of Christ. Not only was his birth unique, but we have the claims of Christ that are certainly unique. He claimed that he was more than a man. In fact, he claimed to have absolute moral authority. I've had people say things like this. After I remember after one particular wedding, somebody asked the question to somebody else, who was that guy up there pontificating? I thought, wow, I'm, I'm right there beside the Pope now. <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> Took a step up in some people's minds, stepped down in other people's minds, but who is that up there pontificating? They felt like, who, who is he to say things like that, you know, the, you know the, about marriage or things of like that? It was a wedding, and so I can't remember what was said, but Jesus claimed to have all authority. In Matthew chapter 28, the passage that we just read, reread read verses 1 through 10. If you jump down to verse 18, if you're following along in your Bible, it says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Whoa, that's a pretty big claim. All authority in heaven and on earth. Not just here. I'm not just the know-it-all here on earth, but I'm in charge of everything here and up there. I mean, that's a pretty boisterous claim, isn't it? Very unique. Not only did he claim to have all authority, he claimed to be able to give eternal life. In John chapter 5, verse 21, he says, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. This guy claimed that he could give eternal life to whomever he wanted to. Folks, that's why I always say, don't call Jesus just a good man. Don't call Jesus a prophet. Oh, he was a Jewish prophet. Yeah, he lived. Okay, pastor mentioned the sources. Okay, the Encyclopedia Britannica acknowledges that and other very well-known scholars. And so we have to assent to that. But he was just a good man or a good prophet. You can't just... Folks, he was ludicrous to make these kind of statements if he wasn't who he really was. He was a madman. We'd lock him up today if he wasn't really the Christ. Of course, if you're not following exactly, I believe he is the Christ. <laughs> That's what we're leading up to. So he claimed to have all authority, all moral authority on he in heaven and on earth. He claimed to be able to give eternal life. He claimed that all judgment was entrusted to him. John chapter 5, verse 22, Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. He claimed to be able to forgive sins. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 5, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, get up, take your mat and go home. In Luke chapter 7 verse 48 he told the woman, your sins are forgiven. Who can forgive sins but God alone? That's what the Jews said. And so they picked up stones to stone him. They knew what this guy was claiming. They didn't believe he was who he claimed to be and so they sought to stone him for blasphemy. He not only claimed to have all authority in heaven and on earth, he not only claimed to be able to give eternal life, he not only claimed to be able to forgive sins, he also claimed to be God. Now when people claim to be God today, what do we think of them? <laughs> you know, I, in a way, I'm glad I wasn't born back then. 
because Christ came at a pivotal time when the Jews of that century and of that day and age did not have the New Testament, which comments on all of the fulfilled prophecy and helps to tie everything in. And you had to be a pretty sharp individual or sit at the feet of the disciples or Jesus himself to be able to put, you know, connect all the dots. And I'm afraid I might have sided with the wrong group. You know, I might say, hey, these Pharisees guys, they've gone to rabbinical school, you know, they've sat under the feet of some of the greatest theologians and they know the Torah, they know the Tanakh, they know the scriptures, they, and they, these people are smart and, and they say this guy's wrong. And I might have been one of those guys, in fact, depending on what age I was, I probably would have been one of those guys, so hey, I'll go with these guys, you know. I wouldn't even consider the other claims. A lot of people do that today. They go with who they think the authority is on a particular subject and because he's the authority, he must be right. Jesus claimed to be God. He said, I and the Father are one in John chapter 10, verses 30 through 31. He was not just claiming unity with God. He was claiming to be very God of very God. That's how the early church put it. It's hard to describe the Trinity. And so they would just simply say, very God of very God. God the Son, the eternal Son of the same essence, co-eternal and co-existent. In John 14, 6, Jesus answered and said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Wow. No one comes to the Father except through me. This guy's either a madman or who he claimed to be, but don't just call him a good man or a good prophet. He had to be the pinnacle of liars if he wasn't who he claimed to be. You say, well, that's, those are all things he claimed. That doesn't prove anything. Anybody can claim anything. I could stand up and claim to be the Messiah. There are people today standing up and claiming to be the Messiah, right? Claims don't mean anything. What are the proofs that back up his claims? Well, well attested to are the miracles that Jesus performed during his life. Things like calming the storm simply by commanding it to be calm. In Mark chapter 4, Verse 39, it says, he got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. And what happened? You know the story. The wind stopped and the waves ceased immediately. So much so that these experienced fishermen who were scared to death, right? That's why Jesus is sleeping in the boat, <laughs> snoring away. These guys are saying, we're going to drown. Somebody wake up Jesus. And they wake up Jesus, and he looks at, oh, you of little faith. He stands at the front of the boat. I'm guessing that's where he stood. And he simply says, be still and nature obeys him why does nature obey Jesus because he's the creator of nature John 1 1 John chapter 1 um, excuse me verse 3 I think it is in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God the same was in the beginning with God all things were made by him and not anything has been made that has been made something like that look it up John 1 3 <laughs> He is the creator of all that exists, co-creator with God the Father. And so nature has to obey him. He's the one who spoke it into existence. He can speak it to be quiet. And he could speak it out of existence if he wanted to. It's not a hard thing for God. People think, oh, the resurrection, that just sounds too difficult. It sounds too unbelievable. Here's what's unbelievable. If you want to think of things that are difficult, is that God simply said, let there be earth. Let there be light. Let there be man. Let there, and, and things came into existence out of nothing. Folks, if I was going to make up a religion, I would not make up a religion like that. That's too unbelievable. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's the things in the Bible that sometimes you look at and you think, man, this, this is too unbelievable. To me, that helps to verify the scriptures, not disprove them. Because if I'm going to make up a God and I want to make up my religion that people will follow so I can become the priest of that religion so they'll pay me money so that I can exercise authority over them by my influence, I'm going to make up a religion that's believable. You know, I'm not going to put things in there that, how did he do that? He fed the 5,000 from five loaves and two fishes. He fed 4,000 on another occasion. He walked on water. And I've heard liberals say, oh, he knew where the sandbar was. Come on, people. <laughs> the disciples would have known too. They were fishermen. They wouldn't have been fooled by that. And then Peter wouldn't have sunk. You know, sandbars aren't usually cliffs. You don't stand on a sandbar and the other person that you're grabbing a hold of to pull them up is sinking. 
You know, they might there be a foot down or two feet, but there, there, it's, that wasn't an underground cliff. And we're talking about the Sea of Galilee, not the, you know, the Atlantic Ocean out here where it may drop off sharply. Actually, I heard another person say it was rocks. Jesus was walking on the rocks. And it really wasn't important that he did a miracle. What was important was what he was trying to teach. That's what the liberals do with the scriptures. It wasn't really the miracle. People get lost in the miracle. The disciples thought it was a miracle. That's okay. But what was really important when he's trying to teach them, keep your faith on me. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Well, folks, there you go again. What a ludicrous liar. Keep your eyes on me because I'm just tricking you. <laughs> Surprise! I'm not who you thought I was. I'd say that makes him a madman. Teaching people, teaching people, if he didn't really walk on the water and he's fooling them, come on. And yet those are the arguments that I hear. He claimed to be God, claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed to be the way of God. We've already looked at some of those passages. In John 8, verse 58, he says, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. You remember the Exodus story. Back when Moses was talking to the theophany of God there in the burning bush. And he says to God, he says, you know what, God, they're not going to believe me when I go back and tell them all of a sudden I'm their leader. <laughs> so what, who do I tell them has sent me? And, and what does God answer? What does he say? Do you remember? Tell them. You just watched Charlton Heston, right? <laughs> I am who I am has sent you. I am being, the basic meaning to that is this self-existing one independent of all of creation. Why? Because he's outside of creation. He created creation. He created matter. He created substance that we touch, feel, and smell and sense. God is beyond all of that. And so he simply said, tell him I am who I am. And here Jesus says to those who are listening to him at this point in time in John chapter 8, before Abraham was born, making sure that they understood he wasn't simply making reference to some other I am construction at some other point in history, but that he was going right back to Moses at the burning bush. Before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus claimed to be God, and he was. He not only exercised authority over nature, over the elements, he also cast out demons, it says in several places. And I know there are people that don't believe in demons. Folks, if you believe in angels, you have this, there's the same reason to believe in demons. The scriptures talk about them. Jesus talks about them. Fallen angels who are at odds with God, who are working havoc in the world around us, in the spiritual realm that we are sometimes completely unaware of. He healed people with diseases, multiple diseases, people with, with actual diseases. These weren't cronies brought in from the neighboring village, you know, with a cast on their arm that wasn't really broken and will take the cast off. Oh, look, a miracle, they're healed. <laughs> yeah, today, we've discovered all sorts of fakes and hoaxes in the religious realm. And, and people become disillusioned. They say, well, this guy on TV, man, I saw on ABC the special they did on him, and he was communicating via his microphone with ushers out in the lobby that they, the information that they had heard about this person as they came in and registered. Some of you may have saw that special. And all sorts of tricks and deceptions that are sometimes used by people who claim to be people of God. But these, these weren't staged acts these were in small towns. Nazareth was about a town of about 300 people at the time of Christ. I've been there. I've been to this little rinky-dink village. I mean, it's the Hudson of, of Israel, right? The way Hudson used to be. Some of you were here years ago, and you remember, I remember when Hudson was a spot in the road, and nobody, nobody lived north of 52, right? And this was like the most remote part. Ridge Road, I was telling people the other day, Ridge Road was a dirt road when I was a kid. When I was 15, I used to ride my dirt bike, about a quarter of a mile from 19, Ridge Road was paved. The rest of it was all dirt road. Lemon Street, dirt road. All, it was all dirt road. We'd ride from, we'd hop on our motorcycles, our dirt bikes, and ride down Massachusetts Avenue to behind Magnolia Valley Golf Course. We'd cut up through the woods, and we would ride all the way to Spring Hill on trails. And at that time, Spring Hill, they had just, they had cleared all of it, and it was just sort of like sand dunes with the paved roads. They had the roads in, and they were putting in the utilities. And I'll bet you those people loved us on our dirt bikes because we would rip up those places. You know, I mean, not, not to rip them up, but we just had a blast sailing over these things. You know, you'd go, come up the little sand part and come down to the road. And, but we would ride all day long on trails. That's the Nazareth of the scriptures. 
a rinky-dink village. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody, they knew whether you were really blind. They knew whether you were really a paralytic from birth. They knew whether you were really deaf or mute. They knew whether you really had an issue of blood, like the woman who had it for years, who touched the hem of Jesus' garment and was instantly healed. That Jesus wasn't doing tricks. He wasn't a master magician. It's interesting, as I was reading in preparation parts of the Babylonian Talmud, as I was mentioning, there was sort of a little debate there to whether some of those references were to Jesus. Well, the one Jesus, and there were other, again, Yeshua's, Joshua's in the times of Christ, and there was one who lived even before the time of Jesus who had disciples and led people astray there in Judea, and they, they eventually killed him. They stoned him, and he ceased to exist, and nobody knows about him today. It's very interesting. And there were other false messiahs before and afterwards during the Maccabean Revolution and other times there were false messiahs. You don't hear of them much anymore, do you? Unless you take some sort of religious class, a graduate class maybe on, on religion and of Judaism, but you still hear of Jesus. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a simple man-made cult that died out after a few years with a few followers. It wasn't a Jim Jones type of thing where nobody follows him now. And, and today we even think, don't drink the Kool-Aid. And you know what that means, don't you? Don't drink the Kool-Aid. And yet there are adherents to Christianity all around the world. Because it wasn't a cult. Jesus exercised power over nature. Jesus exercised power over the demonic world. Jesus ex exercised power over diseases. Jesus also raised the dead. Just before the triumphant entry, just before the triumphant entry, as Jesus was coming toward Jerusalem, making his journey that way, just before that, he stopped in a town where a friend of his had died. He had been buried, wrapped in 75 pounds of grave clothes and cloths. When he told him to roll away the stone, what did they say? Lord, you sure about that? By this time, this is my paraphrase, <laughs> by this time he what? Stinks, or King James, stinketh. It's a little worse than stinks. Stinketh, ooh, he stinketh. <laughs> They roll away the stone and Jesus does what? Goes in, drags the guy out, does some CPR. <laughs> Look, it's a miracle! No, he simply stands at a distance and says what? Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes hopping out. Because it was like mummification in those days when they wrapped him up in the cloths. The, the reason they did that was because of the odors. I mean, they're burying them in these outdoor terms. In fact, if you go over to Israel today, you can go, if you're looking over the, um, the valley, Valley of Hinnom, in modern day terms, on the east side of Jerusalem, what's it called? And, and Kidron. Kidron Valley, thank you. And you're looking up there at the side of the Mount of Olives. It's littered with tombs. You can see the holes, the opening. It's littered with tombs. And there, there are houses actually built on the tombs of ancient people there. There's caves all over Israel. I think that's why it says in Matthew chapter 24 during the tribulation period when the Antichrist will start to persecute the church of God and the people of God, it says, let them which are in Judea flee where? To the, to the mountains. Why? Because there's cave after cave after cave after cave. We went down to the Dead Sea area and we saw the Qumran community and there's just caves and caves and caves and caves. And you know what? They can't get you with infrared. You hide in the caves, right? They that. Why, why couldn't we get Bin Laden for so long? What was part of it? Because... They're always underground. And you can hide from sound, you can hide from infrared, you can hide from all sorts of things. And I think that's why Jesus has warned the people of that time in advance, flee to the mountains, flee to those caves. That's another subject. So you're going, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Jesus also fulfilled messianic prophecies. One of the greatest evidences for the messiahship of Jesus Christ is that he filled, though, fulfilled those prophecies in his lifetime that were written hundreds and hundreds of years before him. And not only did he fulfill them, but folks, think about this. His enemies fulfilled some of them. Psalm says that they would give him gall and vinegar to drink. He's hanging on the cross and he says, I thirst. And a Roman soldier, the same people that are crucifying him, takes him, puts on the end of his spear a sponge, and they give him gall and vinegar to drink. The very people who didn't want others thinking he was a king, because of their paranoia and losing their own kingship. I mean, read about the Herod family. The Herods killed everybody that was a threat to them, even their stepkids, their real kids, their wives, anybody that was a threat. Read about jealous rulers. <laughs> read about the Herods. They were jealous rulers. There are people like that today, though, when they have positions of power, will do almost anything to keep those positions of power. 
But Jesus' enemies fulfilled those prophecies. It said not a bone would be broken. And so when they came and they broke the bones of the thief on one side and the bones of the thief on the other side, but they came to Jesus and because he had already expired, they didn't break his legs, which would help them to asphyxiate faster because they could no longer push up and down on the cross. Their diaphragm would become so tired they, they would asphyxiate. Now they just came to Jesus and said, look, he's already dead. Pow! And popped him with a spear. Just stabbed him in the side. You say, that sounds cruel. They, folks, they were cruel back then. They were cruel. And Jesus truly died. He didn't just swoon on the cross. They would have known that. These were men acquainted with war, with hand-to-hand, face-to-face combat, slashing people with a sword, stabbing them with a spear. You make sure your enemy is dead. You don't make mistakes. When they took them on the cross and agreed to give them over to Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus to be buried, it wasn't like the Roman just stabbed and walked off and said, sure, go ahead, take the guy. I don't care if he's dead or not. No, I am sure being a Roman soldier, he checked it out and checked it out twice. Because then when he got and they buried him in the tomb, they also put a seal on the tomb so that his disciples couldn't come and steal the body. So the authority of Rome was stamped on the front of that tomb. You're going to make sure that guy's dead before you do something like that. And so even in the not breaking his bones, some of the rabbis dismiss Jesus as their Messiah because they say he didn't fulfill the prophecies of Ezekiel and Jeremiah regarding the kingdom. Jewish people today are looking for a Messiah who will set up an earthly kingdom. Jesus said he would do that, but he's going to do it in the future. First, he had to suffer and die for the sins of mankind. And while they're looking at some prophecies regarding the kingdom that the Messiah would set up, they fail to look at other prophecies like Isaiah 53, which says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, what? The iniquity of us all. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Isaiah 53 is the suffering Messiah. Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 says that he would have to be cut off. The word cut off in the Hebrew is the same that was used for capital punishment in other Old Testament passages. Messiah had to die. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10 says, And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced hundreds of years before Jesus ever came. That's the prophecy of Zechariah. There's all these Old Testament prophecies that talk about the suffering Messiah as well. Yes, the Messiah will establish a kingdom. But before he could do that, he had to die for the transgressions of humankind, for our sins. Why? So God could rightly forgive us. You see, sin has to be punished. It's like a parent that says, just say, Jeff's my kid. Jeff, don't do that. Jeff, you do that, you're going to get a spanking. You've seen parents do this, right? Jeff, don't do that. Jeff, I said don't do that. Jeff, if you do that again, you're going to get it, Jeff. I'm going to tell your dad when, when your dad gets home, Jeff. And then we never do anything about it. But maybe you spanked the other kid the day before, right? <laughs> That's not fair. Jeff did that and he got away with it. You see, we recognize. God said in the day that you do this, to Adam and Eve, you will surely die. And he was talking about not just physical death, but spiritual death. As a righteous God, he's a loving God, but he's also a righteous God. So sin has to be punished. But because he loved you and he loved me, he decided before we were ever born to send his son to bear the punishment for us, to suffer in our place, so that we wouldn't have to be separated from God for all of eternity in a place called hell, but that instead we could live with him forever in a place called heaven. Man, that's the kind of God that I know, the kind of God that I want to love, the kind of God that I want to be with, a God who thought about me before I was ever born and made a plan, made a plan for me to be with him by grace. Jesus was unique, the monogene of God, the only begotten Son of God, very unique, so unique there will never be anyone like him again. Never anyone before him or after him like him. That's why C.S. Lewis said this in relationship to who is Jesus. He says, A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God 
or else he is a madman or something worse. You cannot take middle ground with Jesus. He was either a lunatic or he was the Messiah. His life, his miracles, his teachings are anything but that of a lunatic. And finally, his resurrection proves he was who he claimed to be. Jesus has come back from the dead. And if Christ be risen, the Bible says, if Christ be risen from the dead, so also shall we rise from the dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Those of you who believe in Jesus Christ, here is the promise of Scripture. It says, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. That, notice the, the condition is in Christ. Are you in Christ? If you are, you will someday be made alive again. That is your body. You say, I thought when you died you went to heaven. Yes, your spirit does. Your body gets buried in the ground where it decays, turns back into dust. From dust you were created, from dust you'll return. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, right? But God will say someday from the heavens, come up, and that dust will, and our bodies will be reformed just as Adam and Eve's bodies were formed. They'll be glorious bodies, incorruptible bodies, recognizable like they are now, because I believe that when Jesus came back from the dead, they recognized them. Now, he veiled himself at times, I know that, but otherwise they could recognize him. And so we will have those incorruptible bodies that will go into the air, meet our spirits, and so we will live with the Lord forever. This is our promise in Scripture. This is what enables Christians around the world to endure the persecution that they enable from the beginning of the church to this moment. They were killing Christians in the first, second, and third centuries, and they're still killing Christians today. A lot of people are unaware of that. Talk to Marlene. Wave, 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 wave Marlene. She's a representative of Voice of the Martyrs. She can tell you the countries. She can give you literature, photographs. It's unbelievable the number of Christians that suffer around the world today. But we live in America. We enjoy freedoms that other people don't enjoy. Thank God. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad we're here. But we don't want to forget those who don't have the same freedoms that we have. Because Christ was made alive, you someday will live as well. That's the promise of Scripture. That's what Easter is all about. Let's pray. With heads bowed and eyes closed, Jesus was no ordinary man. He was the Son of God. All of history has been divided, A.D. and B.C., by the birth of Jesus Christ. To this very day, He impacts the lives of people and changes lives. He stands at the right hand of God the Father Almighty to make intercession for those who know Him so that someday we will be able to be with Him forever. But my question to you this morning is on this Easter Sunday morning, do you know Christ as your Savior? Do you simply know about Him or do you know Him as your Savior? You may think, well, I'll think about that later, Pastor Dean, when I'm old, decrepit. You know, right now I've got things to do, money to make, errands to run. Folks, you are not guaranteed life. We did a funeral here just a couple days ago now of a young man, 27 years old, who had no idea that he wouldn't be here today. You do not have a guarantee on life. I'm not trying to scare you. That's just the facts of the matter. We don't have a guarantee on life. Don't put off knowing Christ. If you don't know him right now in the quietness of your mind, you can call out to him and ask for forgiveness and he will forgive you. You may want to do it with a simple prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. And right now, the best I know how, with all of my heart, I'm putting my faith and my trust in you and what you did on the cross for me. I'm not trusting in myself because I know it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but I'm trusting in Jesus who died for me. Be my Savior. Forgive me. And give me eternal life. I'm trusting you. With heads still bowed and eyes still closed, this morning if you prayed that prayer, would you raise your hand and just wave at me for a second? I'd like to rejoice with you, okay? Good. Good. I see, I see those hands. There's a man walking around who'll give you a piece of literature. And when he comes by, just say, it, it deals with now Bible verses that talk about what we've been talking about this morning, how you can continue with Christ. If anyone else wants one, just raise your hand. 
maybe you've trusted Christ before, but you're thinking, hey, I'd like one of those free books. <laughs> Anything free, I'll take it. Just hold him up for a minute till he sees you. John, right behind you there. Keep him up. He'll come around. For those of you who are Christians, you know the Lord. John, right, right behind you there. For those of you who are Christians, the Bible teaches us that this is our hope. That we, we can go through hell on earth because we know our home is in heaven. We're just passing through. We're like the flower or the grass that appears for a day and then fades away and, and we're gone. Are you ready for that day? Are you ready for eternity? And are you living your life in light of that? Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we have this blessed hope. It's not pie in the sky. It's not mythology. It's not even man-made religion. It's your truth communicated to us through your Son, the one and only Jesus Christ, the Messiah. We thank you this Easter Sunday morning for the things that we read and see in your word and that we know to be true because of what he did and who he was. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to close this morning with a wonderful song. I love this song. It talks about our salvation being in Christ alone. Would you stand with us as we close? In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all.
beautiful flowers remind us of a beautiful life that passed last Saturday night. Many of you may not, I think many of you were here, but some of you may not have known about it. You may not have been here, but Dakota Nicholas Williams died in a accident last Saturday. We had his celebration of life service the other night. And uh, Bonnie and his father, Gerald, are still here this morning. And if you didn't get a chance to talk with them and you'd like to, they're right up front here and they'll be around for a little bit after the service. And so you may want to just come up and greet them or say whatever you'd like to say in relation. Tell them a happy story about Nick. He's with the Lord. The flowers are beautiful because God created them. Imagine what it's like in heaven where the Bible says that the streets are made out of not only pure gold, transparent pure gold. Oh, can he do that? Oh, he can do that. (laughs) Folks, he can do that. He can do it easy. He's God. He's God. Father in heaven, dismiss us with your blessings. We thank you for this day when we remember and celebrate not just the life of Jesus, but his resurrection. We look forward to the day when we will be with him. In Jesus' name, amen.